All right, all right. Welcome, viewers. This is The Other Paul, helping lay Christians to understand the Holy Scriptures in their theological, linguistic, and historical context. Now, this first video is more or less going to be a test video on how well I use my hardware, software, and most importantly, the video format. Now, it's a test video, but nonetheless, it is on a real topic. A minor one, but a legit topic that should be addressed. And that is a specific Catholic proof text from the Holy Scriptures for the Immaculate Conception. Or rather, how it doesn't refer to the Immaculate Conception. So, get yourself a cup of tea, sit back, and I hope you learned something. So this is the specific article we'll be addressing here, uh, presented by a certain Fairbin, uh, apparently originally at a discussion board. Um, so we'll be reading these highlighted sections, giving the basic argument, at least the introduction to the basic argument. Just as the man Christ Jesus is accepted from original sin, and just as that fact can be demonstrated from specific scriptural verses when those verses are correctly understood, Mary is accepted from original sin, and this fact can be demonstrated from specific verses. One well-known verse that shows this is Luke 1.28, and particularly the angel Gabriel's salutation to Mary, Chere kechritomene. Translated in the Dewey Reims and other Catholic versions as Hail, full of grace, or Gratia plena in the Latin Vulgate. Uh, and then he quotes from the Dewey Reims translation passage. It should start with, um, if I remember correctly, something like the angel Gabriel came to a virgin. He kind of uh, started the quote at a very awkward spot. So Gabriel came to a virgin, or the angel came to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel, being come in, said unto her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Who, having heard, was troubled at his saying, and thought with herself, What manner of salutation should this be? Uh, this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. So the author's basic argument that he will develop later on here is that this uh, second word here, kecheritomene, uh, uh, it... It comes from a root word that simply means to bestow favor upon someone, to show them grace. Um, but the for specific form here renders it as uh, one who has been or is graced or favored. Uh, his argument is going to be that the specific form of the word used here uh, by Luke the Evangelist uh, implies that this was some sort of perfect, complete favor, which uh, by extension proves a sort of immaculate conception um, well before this, and that's a good, it's a good evidence for the doctrine. Um, now, Catholics don't have to make this argument from this passage. They, they, they believe that it's, well, a legit, legit reference to the immaculate conception, but this passage, even if it didn't exist, even if, it, if it's wrong, their interpretation, that doesn't prove the immaculate conception for them. They believe that so-called sacred tradition uh, proves the Immaculate Conception as a true doctrine. The only real reason why they appeal to this passage in debate with Protestants is, well, obviously because Protestants, us, us Protestants, are, well, we're sola scriptura. If a major doctrine is absent in the Bible or explicitly contradicted by it, we simply do not, and the latter case cannot, believe in it. So there's an especially powerful argument when a Catholic can at least try to prove uh, a doctrine from, a Catholic doctrine from the Holy Scriptures, because then they can say, oh, look, you prots, you believe that the uh, Scriptures alone are the authority. Well, guess what? The Scriptures say that Mary was immaculately conceived. Checkmate, dirty prot. <laughs> or at least that's that's how my traditionalist Catholic friends would, would uh, put the argument against me. Uh, so that's what he's going to try and prove here. And now we're going to see if he actually succeeds. Spoiler alert, he doesn't. Now, I kind of already defined the word in the last section uh, briefly, although I was meant to just uh, do it over here with reference to ancient Greek dictionaries. So the first reference is to a dictionary known as, uh, commonly known as Liddell and Scott. It's been the standard ancient Greek dictionary for, geez, something like probably close to a century now. I'm not entirely sure of the timeline. Someone please uh, fact check me there. But either way, it's been the stock standard for a very long time. And uh, as a result, some of its English can be a little bit archaic. Uh, but nonetheless, over here, it's it's pretty solid. 
So this is my first reference. Um, the word simply means to show grace to someone, to bestow favor upon them, uh, and likewise in the passive sense, so when the subject has an action acted upon them, to have grace shown to one uh, or to be highly favored. And here they reference uh, the Luke passage right here, Luke one twenty eight. Now, the dictionary I prefer to use is a very recent one from 2015 known as the Brill Dictionary of Ancient Greek. This one is more modern, uses more up-to-date English. Uh, most importantly, it, re, it re-looks at all the ancient Greek sources for all the words that they use, over 140,000 or something like that, ancient Greek words. Um, more comprehensive, uh, they'll have better access than the original uh, LSJ authors um, and such. Um, and especially, something I especially love is their better formatting. Now, LSJ, sometimes on longer entries, can be an absolute nightmare to read through but these guys have a very consistent formatting uh, that you can see actually at the very uh, back the ver- sorry the very front of their book they have a key for how their formatting works and this is actually this actually here is a photo of a physical edition I actually have right here um, it's a bit of a thick <laughs> chungus of a dictionary so I'm not exactly going to pull it up and show it to the camera it was better for me just to take a photo underline the relevant sections etc so better dictionary far longer entry on ke- on Harito as you can see uh, but it more or less shows the same thing. To show favor, to give grace, passive sense to receive great favor, be the object of favor, so on. And with a direct reference, actually, in the purple underline to its use in Luke one twenty eight, where they actually adopt the uh, Vulgate gratia plena, or in the Dewey Reams after that, full of grace translation. Um, but again, probably, may- maybe even in anticipation of uh, Catholic apologists using their dictionary against us dirty prots, uh, they underline, they have a second section in brackets right here saying variously interpreted. So take that as you will. Um, that's, uh, that's more or less the word's definition. Now, I could have just left it at saying this is what the word means, but, sorry, the reason why I appeal to these dictionaries and show their direct references here on the screen for you to look at and for you to look up is because my channel, I don't just want to give information for Christians to absorb, but my main purpose is really to be an example for how Christians ought to go about investigation and building up their own intellectual rigor. Um, so because of that, I don't just want to show, I don't just want to tell you the information I found. I want to show you my exact research myself. I want to give you the exact references that you yourselves can follow up so that you too can actually be well, uh, well, uh, learned in these topics and not just rely on me as a secondary source who translates information for you. Uh, I will help translate information, but I will also ultimately have the primary sources right there on the screen and in the descriptions linked, uh, cited for you guys to follow up yourselves so that you too can uh, become learned in these topics uh, and ultimately, uh, by God's grace, follow my example and uh, become educated as well. So that's why I want to do this. I don't want people just to follow me. I want people to learn how to do this stuff themselves. That's my main purpose. That's why I'm doing all this. Now, I define the word now because the author, well, takes a while, almost towards the end of this article, really, to actually give a definition of the word. So I thought I'd just get that over with now before continuing on. Anyway, back to the article. Starting from the yellow underline. In the old thread, one of our wise and Protestant fellow travelers pointed out that the word Gabriel uses uh, when saluting Mary, kecheritomene, is formed from the same root, charito, as a word used in one of the early great, uh, the great early Christian hymns. The hymn appears in the first chapter of Ephesians. There, the relevant stanza is, For the praise of the glory of his grace that he granted us in the beloved. Now, again, because I'm obsessed with the uh, giving you the information, here's the passage in uh, one of, in my Greek text, my Greek New Testament. Oh, sorry, one of my Greek New Testaments right here. Um, and this is basically the passage here. The word in question, echeritosen, uh, the same, wor- same word as kecheritomene, as used in Luke one twenty eight, just with a different form, right here in this red underline. And the full section that he quoted there in English, it starts from here uh, in the Greek, and it says, Is epenon doxes te charitos of tu, ene echeritos ene mas ento echapemendo. Which simply translates to what he said. And uh, again, word in question, echeritosen. Now, I want to focus on this one a bit because I believe that the use of this word in this passage is more or less a total defeater of the Catholic argument from the use of the word 
uh, in Luke one twenty eight as a proof of the Immaculate Conception. Because if they can say that from that word in and of itself, that therefore Mary was immaculately conceived, then, well, hang on, if God does that same word, action, grace, favor towards us, emas in the ancient Greek, uh, which contextually is in reference to all believers then does that mean we're all immaculately conceived? I mean, obviously not. That kind of destroys the point of the Marian dogma that she was a unique, uh, sinless vessel uh, for to, to carry Christ. So that obviously, that obviously that argument just cannot work. Now, I don't think the author encountered that argument, but he does somewhat kind of anticipate it. And later on, he tries to draw a wedge, drive a wedge between Kekaritomene uh, and this word in Ephesians, Ekaritosen. Same word, but he tries to drive a wedge between their forms and how somehow the form used in Luke uh, somehow makes an uber special level up kind of uh, form of the word for Mary. But we'll get there when we get there. Uh, now he goes on to describing the very form of the word used in Luke. And at least at the start, uh, his descriptions are more or less correct. Reading on. The variant of karito here in the Ephesians passage is ekaritosen, while kekaritomene is, according to everything I've read, a perfect passive participle. Ekaritosen is an indicative active aorist. Kekaritomene means having been or have already been graced. And in his citation below in a commentary, which quite well describes what the perfect tense is, the perfect action of the participle, in uh, at least in reference to Psalm 118, that's the context of this uh, statement, the perfect action of the participle is considered to have been completed before the time of the speaker. How long before is not a consideration, but the Greek verbal idea is that the action has already been completed. Time is still secondary, but perfected action must imply the past in relationship to the speaker. The person using the word is confessing that the one referred to has already been blessed. So that's more or less the Greek perfect tense here. It refers to a past action, or rather it refers to the present results of a past action. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a mixing together of a present and a past tense. And even that might be a bit of a crude description. But basically... Uh, it's like in English when we say, for example, ah, I've been shot or I am shot. Uh, it's referencing a past action when you were shot, but the main emphasis is on the fact that you uh, have been shot, the results of that past action. So case in point, the, the bullet hole in your leg and all the blood gushing out. So the present results, the bullet hole, the blood uh, of the past action of being shot. So I have been shot. And that's more or less what the... Uh, perfect tense here in ancient Greek does. It hints at a past action, uh, but mainly in reference to its present results. So in this case, uh, in the Psalm 118, uh, referring to have already been blessed. I presume, I presume in the Greek text of this uh, of this passage, because the Hebrew is a little bit different. But uh, oh yeah, yeah, it looks like it. So it's using the Greek Old Testament. Um, so yeah, have already been blessed or am blessed. Often the perfect is actually translated to mean something like a present tense. So I am blessed, uh, which would simply mean that you're in a present state of being blessed, but resultant from a past action. So anyway, that took a while just to say one very simple thing, something I definitely need to work on. Uh, but that's more or less what the perfect tense means. Now. In the next section, he takes this understanding, this simple definition of the perfect, and he tries to add things onto it, which then eventually leads on to his claim that therefore the word used in Luke, being a perfect tense, means that Mary was immaculately conceived. And that's where he really starts to make big slip-ups with respect to his evidence, his argument, and just his general knowledge of Greek grammar. So that's where we're going to now how he uses, or rather misuses, ancient Greek grammar. Now, the author continues. In other words, the perfect tense in Greek is a past tense with a special meaning. It is used to refer to a past action which has effects felt in the present. So here's what some modern English-speaking scholars tell us kecheritomene denotes, based purely on the definition of the word and its grammatical use. Now, this, uh, this second highlighted part, this is where the first, really the main big blunder, big error comes in, uh, one which happens to prove instrumental for his case. It is permissible on Greek grammatical and linguistic grounds to paraphrase Kecheritomene as completely, perfectly, enduringly endowed with grace. 
Now, before I go before I go to my reference to show why this is wrong, I'll just briefly state right here that no, that's not what the perfect says. You, you, you can't demonstrate that kekerito mene means all those extra adverbs completely, perfectly, enduringly, uh, purely on grammatical and linguistic grounds. This is something if it, it, it can mean that, but that can only be determined by the context of the passage. If there's something in the text that suggests that this great that this grace was complete perfect and enduring then then yeah it'd be or it'd be all right to, to paraphrase the word that way but not because of the words own uh, uh, how do I say it because of the words inherent meaning and its form no that is totally wrong and fallacious now I'll continue reading on to the end uh, until I get to my reference my actual grammar reference to show why this is wrong however Luke 128 uses a special conjugated form akarito it uses kekarito menne while Ephesians 1.6 uses echeritosen, which is a different form of the verb charito. Echeritosen means he graced, uh, so a simple, uh, simple past action. Echeritosen signifies a momentary action, an action brought to pass, whereas kecheritomene, the perfect passive participle, shows a completeness with a permanent result. Kecheritomene denotes continuance of a completed action. Wrong. <laughs> it's just, bro. You're just wrong. All right. You, you're just wrong. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up my second reference right here. This is from, uh, oh my gosh, how did I forget the book's name already? Um, Greek grammar something something. I'll have it. I'll have it on the screen right there. But basically, the standard Greek New Testament uh, grammar book by Daniel Daniel Wallace. Um, very comprehensive. Um, gives tons of examples for all the different grammatical constructs, including for this section that I cite here. I'll also give a specific reference to the section on the screen. Um, giving it gives a ton of examples of how the perfect tense is used in the Bible. It's very in various different ways, and he defines the perfect tense and specifically responds to this kind of claim that the perfect tense, in and of itself, can refer to an enduring or a permanent result. Anyway, starting from the definition. The force of the perfect tense is simply that it describes an event that completed in the past. We are speaking of the perfect indicative here. So indicative meaning a just a simple statement of fact or a presumed fact has results existing in the present time, i.e. in relation to the time of the speaker. Or as Zerwick puts it, the perfect tense is used for indicating not the past action as such, but the present state of affairs resulting from the past action. Uh, BDF suggests that the perfect tense combines itself, so to speak, with the present and the aorist in that it denotes the continuance of a completed action. Now, this is where he starts to critique. Chamberlain goes too far when he suggests the perfect tense is used to describe an act that has abiding results. The implication that the perfect tells you that the event occurred and still has significant results goes beyond the grammar and is therefore misleading. Even more misleading is the notion frequently found in commentaries that the perfect tense denotes permanent or eternal results. Such a statement is akin to saying that the aorist tense means once and for all. Implications of this sort are to be drawn from considerations that are other than grammatical in nature. One must therefore, one must be careful not to read, uh, sorry, one must be careful not to read his or her theology into the syntax whenever it is convenient. Sound familiar? That's exactly what our author right here is doing. He is um, to to his um to the um sorry to his credit um he isn't really making this claim up out of thin air. He's taking uh, authoritative grammars that actually say this. So this second one, for example, uh, H. W. Smythe, Greek grammar. This is more or less the stock standard uh, ancient Greek grammar um, from very very long from decades and decades ago. I actually have it uh, right here in my own little personal library. So from that exact same author, and he actually says that the perfect denotes a permanent result, which is, well, not necessarily correct and definitely not correct on the grammatical grounds. So it's actually a very good and authoritative grammar. So I can forgive the author for taking up this argument, uh, especially since, well, since authoritative grammars say this thing, it'd be very attractive for an apologetic standpoint him. But in the end, it is, well, simply wrong. And if you want to see why it's wrong, uh, I do recommend picking up uh, Daniel Wallace's uh, Greek grammar on the New Testament where he shows you all the various different uses of the perfect tense including ones which wouldn't really fit these adverbs of uh, completely, perfectly and enduringly um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's more or less 
that's more or less the argument he tries to do to first drive a wedge between Kekarito Mene and the Ephesians word Ejeritosen uh, to say that one is ordinary, one is uber epic special. And then thus for the uber epic special one to show that, oh, look, it shows a completeness or a permanent action and result, uh, which therefore, well, therefore goes on to mean the Immaculate Conception as he goes on to say down here. One eternity later. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Guys, I had to stop recording in the in the middle of this. I finished one of the final parts, but not quite there. Um, because I was in the middle of the very end of my assignment season, where I, uh, not gonna lie, kind of had to rush a lot. But it's done. It's all done. <laughs> and I can get back to finishing this video looking completely different to how I did originally. Anyway, just to finish off his argument from the word and grammar here, I'll just read this final section. And our friend's citation on what the term denotes, uh, he actually finally defines the word uh, in Greek at this end point. To bestow grace, to show favor to someone, the divine favor for a special vocation. And this is from the linguistic key to the Greek New Testament. This last statement here is something I really want to uh, pick apart. Ironically, that final definition is essentially coextensive or compatible with the Catholic understanding of the why of Mary's sinlessness. Now, this this last bit here's here's the thing. It matters very little how precisely you translate the word, and it doesn't matter what we think of the perfect tense. We we can we can even grant uh, the author's totally well just incorrect view of what the perfect tense denotes, right? Let's just say we, we, we agree with him, we granted it, that it meant complete, perfect, permanent result of some kind. Okay, great. There is a difference between data being compatible with a theory and it being evidence for a theory. When data is... I think, I think everyone should be able to get this quite easily, but just in case not. When data is compatible with something, it just means that it doesn't contradict it. So... Um, for example, someone wanted to prove that dinosaurs were still in existence today. Let's say he points to someone he knew who came home with a massive gash on his arm. And then he appeals to that big gash on the arm and says, See, clearly this must mean that a pterodactyl came down from the sky and tried to kill him. Now, while the gash is definitely compatible with that, it doesn't contradict that theory at all. Uh, in no way at all is it actually direct evidence for that claim. It's not specific. It doesn't, uh, how do I say it? It doesn't specifically and uniquely point to that theory that dinosaurs are still around today. And that's more or less exactly what Fairbairn's trying to do right here. Um, he's not as direct and blunt with it, but that's ultimately dire the direction he's going. He's trying to say, uh, he's trying to use just the mere word and grammar uh, over here on its own in the passage as proof that Mary was therefore uh, purified of all original sin uh, at her own conception uh, so that she'd be a worthy vessel uh, for Jesus. Now, again, in, in light of that, Luke one twenty eight is, sure, it's compatible with that. Um, it is just as compatible with any Protestant understanding of, uh, of that passage. Uh, case in point, uh, Mary having been blessed or is blessed in this passage, uh, could simply refer to the fact that she was elected by God to carry the Savior um, and carried on salvation through to her uh, in light of all that. Very simple. Does not require her uh, require us rather to uh, add on to that the idea of sinlessness at her own conception. Things which are concepts which are totally foreign to this entire passage. You cannot get it from anywhere in there. So that's, that's more or less his main argument here from the grammar, um, from the words, from the Greek in general. That argument is basically gone. So in light of all this, since his argument of, that of trying to drive a wedge between the perfect tense uh, use of this word, charito, and its other use in Ephesians 1.4, the aorist or simple completed action, his argument for trying to draw a wedge between those is just, well, it's fallen flat. 
Um, his specific argument now on using the grammar and the Greek word is thoroughly destroyed. Since if you want to appeal to the world word on its own um, as an argument for the Immaculate Conception, then simply put, uh, God's favor towards us in Ephesians 1 4, or sorry, 1 6, that means we're all immaculately conceived. So his appeal to the grammar, to the Greek here, is bunk entirely. Now we're going on to what Fairbairn claims is his main argument here. So not even the language and grammatical claims, which he spent, spilled a fair amount of ink on, but. Uh, apparently this, the early church fathers, is actually his main argument. However, I still haven't really gotten to my argument. Whatever the denotation of Heire Kehritomene, its connotation, what it actually meant to ancient Greek speakers, is why it is communicating precisely that Mary was immaculately conceived. So he's trying to draw a line between what a word strictly, literally means, and what it means to uh, local native speakers. Basically, an idiom. Uh, he's trying to appeal to an alleged idiomatic meaning of the words that to the authors somehow necessarily pointed to an immaculate conception. We'll see how he goes. Here are a number of ancient experts and what they say it means. Each of them is a Greek speaker from a culture, from a culture basically identical to that of St. Luke. Couple problems here. First of all, ancient experts, what does he mean by that? Does he mean linguistic experts? Does he mean theological or biblical experts? Um, and from a culture basically identical to that of St. Luke, I mean, some many of these are coming from well after the Christ of the third century, the Edict of Milan, which has just gone off the top of my head. Um, and that doesn't exactly, well, they're, <laughs> they're not exactly from an identical culture to put it very lightly. Um, sure, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities. Um, same language in the end, although language had evolved over the centuries. Um, just just either way, these two claims here on culture and that they're ancient experts, he's trying to basically set up, listen to these guys, these guys are ancient authorities, they have some kind of esoteric Gnostic tier knowledge of the language that uh, that we, we just simply don't have, and because they say immaculate conception, therefore we should say immaculate conception. I'm being, I'm being a little bit facetious, but uh, uh, in a comical way, that's basically what Fairman's trying to say. He's trying to say, listen to these authors who lived at the same time, they clearly have some greater understanding of the language and the context than us, therefore they're better. Um, Issue is, there's simply no reason, uh, and he, he almost tries to do it after him, but he really fails. There's really no reason to assume that there's some kind of extra um, culturally specific meaning to this passage other than what the words are saying. In other words, he doesn't actually demonstrate that a connotation exists that is different to the denotation. And I'll show you why this is the case right here. For one, four of these... Uh, you know, four of these references out of seven, so most of them, are hymns. They're not theological or linguistic analyses of the passage. They're hymns. Uh, some of them especially are a very specific kind. Um, called a... What's it called? A heretismu, I believe. Uh, a specific genre of kind of hymn dedicated to the Theotokos Mary. Um, where they say hail, 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 and all these different little, uh, all these different uh, venerating titles towards her. So that's the first issue. Some of them aren't even most. Most of them aren't even giving the intellectual analysis that would demonstrate Fairbairn's point that they culturally understood those specific words and that specific passage to mean that. And and on that matter, uh, at least three of these hymns, I do not believe. Are even uh, even have the passage in the back of their mind. I looked at the Greg Gregory Thaumaturgus one, and I think that was actually from inside a homily that did address the passage, so I'm willing to strike that one off. But these three other hymns here, at least, I do not believe uh, are directly addressing this passage at all. So that's just flat-out wrong citation on the part of Fairbairn. Um, but even then, the most important thing is that every single one of these uh, of these citations, including the more direct commentaries of them, none of them are actually saying uh, that their belief in the Immaculate Conception comes from a sober 
analysis of the passage. In other words, contrary to what Fairbairn here is saying, they're not looking at the passage, reading it in their language with their cultural understanding in the back of their heads, and then saying, hmm, this clearly points towards an immaculate conception. None of them are saying that. It's possible, but none of them are pointing to that at all. It is just as easy, and well, in my Protestant opinion, more likely uh, to assert that they already believe in the Immaculate Conception on the basis of philosophical requirements, and then taking this passage, which somewhat shares the same domain of it, in that it calls Mary blessed, uh, uh, favoured one, that she'll be called blessed by all nations, and then applying their Immaculate Conception doctrine to that, uh, interpreting the passage in light of a prior philosophy, which is, well, the opposite of what Fairbairn is trying to say that they are doing. That's speculation, but then again, it's also speculation when Fairbairn says that they're trying to interpret the passage uh, with respect to language and their culture and such. Um, now, the funniest thing here is his chief reference to Father Luigi Gambero, who wrote uh, Mary and the Fathers of the Church. Now, I have this book <laughs> digitally, and Luigi Gambero, um, he is very popular in a Facebook group of mine called Patristics for Protestants. Now, why would that be a case? This book, he's a, well, for one, he's a Catholic priest, and this book is, well, promoting the Marian dogmas uh, through analysis of the Church Fathers. Why would this book be popular in a group of Protestants who analyze the early Church Fathers? Well, it's for the very specific reason that Luigi Gambero bluntly states that the earliest centuries of the Christian Church were silent. On the Marian dogmas. Dead silent. And specifically with respect to the Apostolic Fathers, for example, so the immediate successes of the apostles and such, uh, he says that they're trying to emulate so called the so called pattern of silence from the New Testament, which rarely mentioned Mary or what she did at all. Um, he still asserts that they believe the dogmas of the early church, and he just comes up with a few excuses to um, to say why they didn't mention it. Um, one of them being, well, that pattern of silence as some sort of reverence to Mary. Um, another one being that it could confuse new believers who are coming out of a culture that worships goddesses, thus they could be confused um, and worship Mary. Um, well, again, special pleading. And uh, us Protestants would definitely take that point on goddesses and the veneration of Mary and kind of flip it the other way around. Um, but look, Either way, it's, 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 it's ironic. Fairbairn more or less cherry-picks what Gambero says here and ignores his most powerful salient point that the Marian dogmas were absent in the early church. Um, but even then, um, I say, uh, going back to my earlier point about the, uh, these figures possibly using, first establishing philosophical belief in the Immaculate Conception and then reading scripture through that belief. Uh, I have reason to believe that, and that is because I actually have uh, occasional discussions with my traditionalist Catholic friends. One of them in particular had a very, very deep discussion on this, and his main uh, reasoning, his main proof for himself believing in the Immaculate Conception, other than that, oh, Papa Church or Mama Church said so, his main proof for believing it was philosophical in nature, and we kind of argued about that back and forth over the entire night. But Point being, he didn't really appeal to scripture. His main appeal was to uh, philosophy, uh, which he would then read the scripture in light of. So that more or less takes down Fairbairn's point uh, that these guys, that these early church fathers, uh, if we were to take that position, if we were to take that speculation, which I admit it's speculation, but frankly, it's more likely than what he's claiming, since none of these guys uh, try to actually do an analysis of the passage with respect to linguistics and etc. Um, but again, that, that, that interpretation would basically um, nullify Thurban's entire argument here. Um, but again, this video um, is not meant to be a massive deep dive into the early church fathers. I um, was, wasn't intending to go super in depth with it. These are just more or less some, uh, some beginner thoughts of it. I think I will, in fact, I definitely will at some point do a video on what the early church fathers uh, taught about stuff like the Marian dogmas or rather what they didn't teach about them, that they didn't teach them at all, at least for the first few centuries of the church, and even almost explicitly, no, did explicitly contradict them at multiple points. Um, but that's for a later video. This was a test video, um, main, mainly meant on the linguistic argument given in this thing. 
Um, but before I go, the number one problem I have with his argument here with respect to the early church fathers, out of everything, out of every error uh, I believe he makes, my number one problem with it is that this is simply cherry picking. That's it. Responsible analysis of, for example, the scriptures and of the early church fathers is a survey. It takes a look at all the available comprehensive evidence and takes the data from that, then makes interpretations in light of that. This method here is basically just taking whatever quotes agree with you and saying, oh, look, see, early church fathers said that. Um, well, problem, you can justify more or less any doctrine and many what Catholics would call heresies just if you were just cherry-picking isolated, out-of-context passages from the early church fathers. You could justify universalism. Heck, multiple uh, Christian universalists, like uh, off the top of my head, David Bentley Hart, for example, they will appoint to many early church fathers who at least seem to promote universalism. But to just look at those who agree with it and not even mention those who don't, well, that's just dishonest. It's not a proper academic uh, study of what the church at large believed, assuming there was unanimity, which on not on every issue there was. You've got to actually look at all the available evidence before you can make a judgment saying, yes, early church, Greek-speaking, ancient experts said this passage meant X or Y. Um, and that point alone, discarding everything else, is why Fairbairn's argument here is a non-starter. So that was my take on Luke 128 and the Immaculate Conception. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope you all learned something from it, especially my Catholic buddies uh, who must become Protestant as soon as possible. Uh, seriously, thank you for watching. Um, again, this is more or less a test video uh, for me to look at to see what works, what doesn't, uh, and how I can ultimately make better video content. Uh, what's even better is actually right now, I've just finally gotten onto holidays uh, from college, which means I'll have a lot of time to organize a schedule for making regular videos, ideally um, at a minimum uh, every once a fortnight, um, but possibly even once a week if I can get uh, efficient enough and have a lot of topics lined up to address. Um, but yeah, I hope to make a lot of high quality uh, educational material on the regular and uh, God willing, if I can do it nice and consistently, hopefully even open up a Patreon so I can possibly make this a second job for myself uh, because this is something serious I want to do and I think will be extremely beneficial uh, for lay and academic Christians alike. So again, thank you for watching. God bless. See you next time.